So welcome to our virtual meeting. We're going to cover a few basic items before we, we begin. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. To members and city staff, members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. I will be responsible for muting and unmuting committee members um, or uh, Kelly Meese uh, will be helping me with that as well. Please use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak or ask questions. Staff click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do their best to call on committee members in the order in which their hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. All right, at this point, uh, I'm just gonna read the, um, the role just so uh, folks who aren't on the committee uh, will have a sense for who's here, uh, who's on the committee. So, um, Sharon Long, Jocelyn Hemming, I'm here. Jocelyn Hemming, Hemming is here. Greg Harrington. I'm here. Greg Harrington is here. Janet Batista. Janet's here. Thank you, Janet. Janet Batista is here. Henry Anderson. You need to unmute yourself, Henry. We see Henry's chair, just not Henry. Okay, maybe he stepped out. I'll, I'll come back to him. Gary Grinke. Does not appear that uh, Gary is here. Henry, we're going through the roll call. Just want to acknowledge that you're here, Henry Anderson. I'm here, yeah. Thank you, Henry. Henry Anderson is here. So right now we have uh, Jocelyn, Greg, Janet, and Henry uh, are present. Gary and Sharon are absent. We also do have a number of uh, water utility staff members that are here. Uh, Dan Rodefeld, our operations manager is here. Amy Deming, our public information officer is here. John, John Gibbons, our water quality program specialist is here. Uh, Kelly Meese, as I mentioned earlier, um, is also here. She's uh, helping out with the uh, water quality management uh, while I'm uh, carrying on my, my responsibilities as the interim director of the water utility. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody else or not. Um, I think that's all of our water quality staff, uh, water utility staff. We also have Jeff Lafferty from Public Health is here. Um, and uh, Dr. Russ Dunkel from uh, Department of Health Services. And Robin Custer from Department of Health Services is also here. All right, uh, continuing through the administrative stuff, uh, materials here. Um, we do have a quorum, so um, we will continue. So uh, in a virtual meeting uh, like this, it is particularly important that we follow an adopted set of rules. Therefore, please do not speak until you have raised your hand and have been recognized. Uh, the chair or I will ask for a motion and second for each agenda item, unless it is noticed for discussion only. Uh, the, the two uh, new business items that are on the agenda are for discussion purposes only. Um, so there won't necessarily be a need for a motion or a second to take up those, uh, those items. Any, any member wishing to join the debate or move an amendment 
or um, uh, make a motion of, a, of any sort uh, will also have to raise their hand and be recognized by me or Kelly. Similarly, if you have some other matter to bring to the attention of the chair, such as a point of order or request for information, please use the raised hand function. We'll do our best to, um, to get to you. So Kelly and I will be uh, monitoring um, uh, that. So um, at this point um, on our agenda, it's the time for agenda repair or announcements. Um, I do have one announcement that uh, previously we had said that we would have a meeting in July. Um, that's not going to be able to happen. Um, but instead, our next meeting will be in August. It will take place on August 9th at 5 p.m. So if you want to mark your calendars uh, for the next meeting uh, will be August 9th. Um, and that's already on the city committee and board uh, meeting page. So that's already been updated there for August 9th. And then the, the following meeting after that will be the regularly scheduled meeting for October. So that will take place on October 11th uh, at 5 p.m. So those are the next two um, the next two meetings. Does anybody on the committee have any announcements or a need for agenda repair? All right. Uh, I just did want to make one comment. This is the place uh, typically in the city meetings where uh, there would be a place for, for public comment. Just want to uh, make those aware that are on the call. Um, there is no opportunity here during the meeting for, for public comment, but uh, we do receive written comments. Um, and so there is a, uh, an email address that's on the agenda. Um, so if you have any comments that you'd like to share with respect to any of the agenda items that we're taking up today, you can send an email to water at madisonwater.org. Um, and, and those comments will be received and distributed to the committee. Uh, and we also share those with the Water Utility Board. So at this point, we'll take up the, um, the approval of the meeting notes. So uh, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes or the meeting notes. Approval. Second. So that was uh, Greg made the motion and uh, Henry uh, seconded it. Uh, hopefully you all have had a chance to review the meeting notes. Um, is there any discussion? All right, hearing none, um, if there is no objection to recording a unanimous vote, or if there's, excuse me, if there is any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of approving the meeting notes, please raise your hand or say aye. Hearing none, the motion passes, the meeting notes have been accepted. All right, we'll move on to our first item tonight. Uh, our first item of business is uh, a continuation of our uh, review of the Water Utility Board fluoride uh, review. Um, so for an update and discussion. So I will start off that uh, discussion. So, um, you know, for those of you that, that read the meeting notes, I think that that probably accurately summarizes uh, some of the activities that we had at our, our previous meeting. Uh, principally, we, uh, we heard from Department of Health Services staff uh, that made a presentation on the National Toxicology Program uh, report uh, and review, um, had some discussion about that. Also, uh, Dr. Russ Dunkel from uh, the Department of Health Services uh, also made a presentation about what happens when uh, communities stop community water fluoridation. And again, 
um, you know, the discussion and the comments that were made there were summarized in the um, in the meeting notes uh, that we just approved. Um, so we had we had those two presentations by Department of Health Services staff, um, in which, like I said, we reviewed the monograph that was evaluating the studies and the conclusions that were drawn. Um, and, and principally, I think the conclusion that has been drawn at this point um, from that from that study is that fluoride is presumed to be neurotoxic uh, at levels that are uh, 1.5 milligrams per liter or higher. Um, and the, that neurotoxicity um, uh, yeah, so, um, so at, at, at levels that are above that 1.5 milligrams per liter. Um, I know, Dr. Anderson, I know you were planning to, uh, to reach out to Kyla Taylor, who is uh, an author of um, the NTP report. And you, uh, we were hoping to have her join us at this meeting. Um, I understand that she was not available to attend and that you tried to find um, a replacement um, for uh, for Kyla in 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 the name of uh, Andrew Rooney. Um, I'm wondering. I, I'm suspecting that you didn't have much success with with that either. No, I didn't. <laughs> but if anything, they're waiting for her to come back. She's on a, a maternity leave, so. Uh, well, and I didn't hear from anybody else. So at uh, NTP. Okay, so so our plan was to hopefully have a, um, a, a presentation and discussion by a member of the uh, NTP staff that, that had drafted that report. Um, unfortunately, um, that, that obviously is, is not gonna happen tonight. Um, we were not able to, to get those confirmations. Um, Continuing with this with this review, I know that we've had some opportunities to. Um, there's been uh, some presentations that have been made um, through webinars. Um, I also know that uh, the um, uh, uh, the um, Wisconsin Environmental Health Network uh, had a presentation uh, by. Uh, Professor Christine Till, um, and uh, I know that uh, there's been a number of other presentations that that she's given not only to to that body, uh, but to other bodies, and um, so so that 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 information and those materials. Hopefully, members of the committee have had the opportunity to um, observe at least one of those uh, presentations. Um, I do have a link to a recorded um, to a recorded presentation that I can share with the committee if there's any members that are still uh, interested in um, in seeing uh, any of those or, or at least that that one presentation from uh, the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network presentation. Um, the general conclusions as as we've already stated is that fluoride is presumed to be neurotoxic. Uh, I know Professor Till has talked um, at many of these presentations about particularly the, the window of toxicity uh, being that prenatal period uh, or when the, the um, uh, in, in utero and also within that six month period, uh, the, the first six months uh, for that infant. Um, and some of these um, exposures to fluoride um, have been demonstrated uh, through these limited studies to uh, potentially have some impact on, on reductions in, uh, in, uh, in IQ. Um, and, and there have been other, uh, also um, some other presumed effects that have been demonstrated in some other limited studies. Uh, I was hoping uh, Dr. Neary was on the, the call and I don't see her on the list of participants. Uh, I was going to give her an opportunity to, to take up that. Uh, but for anybody else who may be um, 
listen to that talk or any other talks, um, any, any comments or, or thoughts that they'd like to share with the rest of the committee. Joe? Yes. Yeah, I, the only thing, and uh, I think the, the charge that we have of, uh, uh, is it likely neurotoxic? I think uh, that's you've, you've sort of indicated that question has been answered and the issue is at what level uh, and how does that relate to uh, the current program? There were a number of questions that have come up on the programs that I've listened to as well. It might be useful to see if there's somebody from CDC uh, or ATSDR uh, on the uh, you know national public health front uh, that uh, could be available to answer some questions or some question about the uh, uh, efficacy of fluoride uh, uh, before the teeth erupt or in utero. Uh, benefits uh, uh, as well as in uh, uh, adults. And I would wonder if having some of the uh, health people nationally might help that. That's perhaps beyond our, our charge, but if we aren't gonna hear from uh, kind of the toxicology side, it might be useful to hear from uh, the uh, kind of the directives at uh, uh, CDC. We, we did have circulated some of the, you know, there's a, still a lawsuit is going on and there's been depositions have been taken and uh, uh, somewhat uh, some of those responses from CDC uh, kind of run counter to some of the other information that has been uh, provided. So I don't know if that would be helpful. I think you may need to go back to the uh, utility board and say, you know, would they like us to facilitate something like that or uh, not? Anybody else? So Henry's raised some um, some other things that I think the committee could could review in terms of um, additional information. But is there other other information that um, the committee would like to hear uh, before they develop uh, a recommendation? Is there is there anything else that uh, the committee would like to hear with respect to fluoride uh, before we try to make some type of recommendation? mostly silent crew today. Uh, so, um, so at this point, um, wondering what the pleasure of the committee is in terms of continuing this, this discussion, um, you know, where, where we are right now, um, is this, is this a, a place where we are, where maybe this is time for um, uh, return to the water utility board with no recommendation um, or return to the water utility board with a recommendation to refer it to the board of public health um, uh, or return with a recommendation to retain the existing policy. I mean, I think that that's where we're currently at right now is maintenance of the, the, um, of the existing policy while pending this review um, but, uh, just, just wondering, um, what folks are thinking in terms of the next steps in terms of where we are and, um, where we'd like to go from here. Dr. Runkle, Dunkel, I'm sorry, Dunkel. 
Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right, Joe. Um, the only comment I've got, as, as Joe had mentioned, the NTP report, but it was my understanding that the Technical Advisory Committee was also going to take into consideration Mason's report. I think it'd be appropriate to bring Mason's report into play as well in this discussion. Yes, thank you. That's on my list of things here to, to okay. talk about, and I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so NASM, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, um, they were charged with completing the, uh, the, the, the peer review uh, for the NTP monograph. Um, and, you know, with respect to that, um, you know, the the one thing, you know, the one thing that stood out for me, um, and of course, this is looking at it strictly from a policy standpoint, um, is one of their final conclusions, which is um, that, you know, and I'm just, I'm just quoting directly from, from that report or that, uh, from that peer review, um, in which they state little or no conclusive information can be garnered from the revised monograph about the effects of fluoride at low exposure concentrations, in particular, less than 1.5 milligrams per liter. NTP therefore should make it clear that the monograph cannot be used to draw any conclusions regarding low fluoride exposure concentrations, including those typically associated with drinking water fluoridation. And I know we've had a little bit of discussion about this in our previous meetings about uh, kind of a dose response type study it would be helpful to identify, you know, the levels at which some of these um, neurotoxic or other health uh, effects are being um, identified. Um, but the general conclusion that 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 I see, um, you know, is that some of these effects are observed at higher fluoride levels, but not at those levels that are typically at drinking water. And it's not to say that there aren't health effects at these lower levels that are that are typical of community water fluoridation, but the the, the evidence is less um, is, is less conclusive, um, you know. And uh, and Jeff, you wanted to make a you wanted to make a comment. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, ask the board if any one of them watched watched the Dr. Till uh, presentation. If they had any questions for myself or Russ or uh, Robin about anything they may have heard during her presentation or other studies that they may have burning questions about that we can try to answer. I would just add, the only question I would have is, I haven't uh, seen, uh, you know, any strong literature on the benefits uh, of fluoride for pregnant women uh, during the pregnancy. Again, not, uh, you know, this would get to a public health approach of providing information uh, to pregnant women uh, or during, uh, before the teeth erupt. And I don't know if uh, Russ has any literature on that, but that was one of the issues uh, I thought that's uh, been raised of uh, focusing on uh, the higher risk period would be prenatal and immediately postnatal. Uh, and that could be handled through uh, advice. Yeah, Andy, are you looking for studies both on pre and post nail? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I'm. I'm looking for. I think the the last time you indicated that it's it's beneficial uh, during pregnancy uh, for the uh, developing fetus, uh, and, and uh, I just haven't seen that. And and again, I thought in the uh, at least the lawsuit were. Uh, CDC was interviewed there. At that point, they were saying they, there wasn't any particular benefit information for during pregnancy. 
clearly yeah, to answer. I'm sorry, Andy, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, on the other hand, uh, for uh, children, and uh, I think the CARES data is, is very strong uh, of a benefit, but it's just a question is that tail off in the earlier uh, period uh, or not? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can give you a sort of a, a two-pronged answer to that, Andy. I mean, the American College of OBGYN recommends that pregnant women drink fluoride. Now, again, extrapolating that, does that mean that there's a, a definite, definitive benefit to the fetus? I have to step back and say that may not be the case. Um, so I, I don't, I want to come out and say that, you know, I do believe I stated that last time, but I'm actually going to pull back a little bit on that because I've looked for the, the scientific evidence on that as well and have not been able to come up with any conclusive proof to, to prove that one way or the other. So I would want to retract that just a little bit. That's, I mean, that I, I'm sort of glad that you couldn't find it either, but I mean, no, I, yeah, I mean, uh, the no, professional I organization. <laughs> Um, and so I don't feel so bad that somehow or other my searching skills have deteriorated since I retired. But uh, I mean, a lot of the professional organizations have developed kind of policy positions, uh, and it's uh, not it's stayed pretty much the same uh, for decades now. And, and so I am only just saying that one of the thoughts would be is. Uh, can we encourage somewhere to gather some more information to see? Because that seems to be from the literature uh, where probably if there is a, a higher risk uh, group for neurologic effects, that's where it's going to be during the development of the fetus. And I would add, if I could, to what Russ said, <clears throat> a lot of the studies that have used um, the fluoride levels in, in the urine, that's not really in, indicative of the fluoride that actually crosses the placenta in the bloodstream because no one's actually measured that. So yeah. you don't know what the, what the dose is. And then to try to attach that or associate that with an IQ issue or you know, whatever without including an actual dose response and actually taking in social factors that also could impact that as well in, in a more effective way is really hard to draw a conclusion that A equals B equals C. So I would add, I would add that. All right, um, Greg or Janet or Jocelyn, do you have anything that you'd like to add to this discussion? Go ahead, Greg. I guess I don't have much to add from the health effects perspective. I think the, um, what I would like to see us do is proceed in a f fashion that meets the timeline you need to meet, Joe. Uh, or what the board needs to meet. So I think if we can maybe get our memories refreshed on when they would like to get a recommendation from us by, uh, I think that would be helpful for me. Uh, and I think whatever recommendation we make, I'd like to make sure we're making it on the whole body of evidence and not just a couple of reports, I guess is the way I would put it. So I'll leave it at that. So um, to address that question uh, in terms of timeline, I think that we've said that uh, we weren't given we weren't given a specific deadline by which we needed to return something to uh, the Water Utility Board. Um, I think our the timeline that I had envisioned and the, the schedule that I had envisioned is that we had um, we had uh, Department of Health Services came and made their presentation. Um, in terms of their evaluation of the NTP report. We've now had the opportunity to review uh, the peer review by NASIM 
the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And then the hope was, is that we were going to have somebody from NTP that was going to come and speak to us. And I think that we, I think Henry had talked to Kayla Taylor, Dr. Kayla Taylor and had um, an indication that after the peer review, she would be available to come and speak. Um, and clearly she's on parental leave right now. And so there was a, there's a timing issue there. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, we could have um, uh, Dr. Taylor or somebody else from NTP come and speak to the body. If, if the committee thinks that that's still important, um, we could do that. That would just delay the time that we would have some type of recommendation uh, probably wouldn't happen until the October meeting, right? Um, and so that would delay it by another three months or so, two months or so. Um, I mean, that's that's certainly um, doable, something that we can do. Um, unless the committee has seen enough information where it doesn't warrant any change in the current policy um, based on the evidence that we've seen or that's been discussed so far. Um, so um, really just taking a step back for the timeline, you know, my, my goal was to have a, a recommendation no later than this, the end of the summer. Um, you know, so by that July or, or August meeting. Um, but I, I had hoped to, like I said, have someone from NTP come speak. We'd have then have some time to digest that and then have a fuller discussion at, at a meeting after that. That, that was that that is what my plan had been. Um, so um, you know, not having that that presentation today either delays it or um, you know removes that from part of the consideration. And I'd leave that up to the committee to decide on that one, I guess. Janet. Well, I brought this up before and I want to bring it up again um, because maybe it could be part of our recommendation. I'm not sure. Um, so basically we're given the task of um, reviewing information about the possible detrimental effects of um, community water treatment for fluoride what we don't have is much information about how protective our level is in our community. And it's really disappointing because it would be simple uh, data analysis to find out, for example, since the time we lowered the amount to 0.7 from 1.5, if there's been any change in the quality or number of carries or however that that's analyzed. And there are other ways to do that too, because there are different parts of the state where there's no fluoride treatment. Um, and so I'm uncomfortable evaluating uh, health-based reports without actually seeing the benefit of the levels that we're using. So in going forward, if we do give a recommendation to keep our levels, I would like to include something about collecting data to find out the, the actual benefits that there are. Anyway, so th those are my comments right now about this. What would you like to see do that um, data collection and analysis? Did you say who? Yes. What body would be responsible for that? Well, I'm not sure about how the agencies work, but it seems to me that there must be some kind of dental, maybe, maybe Dr. Anderson knows, some sort of dental organization that's a part of the Department of Public Health. Um, seems to me that would be the logical body to do it. Henry, do you have a... I, I mean, there's the 
one could, uh, I mean, part of talking to CDC is uh, they may have funds to support some type of a study. Again, that could be uh, uh, encouraged through the university, through uh, family medicine. It could be uh, at the uh, Division of Public Health and Russ would know about that. And it's, it's a matter of, uh, is there some data available? Could we, could a group sit down and think about what existing data might be through uh, uh, Medicaid, uh, where you have a lot of children over time and could do like a, a similar study as, as was done up in uh, Alaska. The, the problem is any kind of a human epi study, as uh, Jeff pointed out, is going to have uh, uh, potential problems with uh, confounding factors, and then and the issue has to be, is there any reason to believe those confounding factors would be associated uh, with a specific uh, outcome uh, that we're concerned about, either fluoride exposure or other. Uh, the other thing would be to look at, and I haven't been able to get that data for uh, of the studies specifically looking at the benefits of uh, uh, fluoride uh, in the water, uh, how is there a dose response seen on the carry side? Uh, as you said, your, your question about 1.5 down to 0 0.7, uh, one thing might be to look at uh, what uh, benefit would be lost if you go down to 0.5. I think that was mentioned very early on of the sort of options of the keeping fluoride in the water. Uh, might be a, a way to approach that. Or as I say, the other would be to uh, put out advice uh, to uh, the high risk uh, uh, pregnant women, if that's, if that's, I think that is another option to do. But I don't know if there's data sufficient to look at all the various studies and see, try to break it down into community levels uh, at different levels. As you say, we can look at elsewhere in the state, you know, maybe 0.5 is too close to what the uh, background is in, in a lot of areas. Jeff. Yeah. So I'm gonna try to unpack that. So I'm not aware of any uh, dental carry data that's sent to the state because I know that we don't get that data. And we've used for our information, at least for me speaking just for, for myself, I've looked at studies that are done in other other communities to, to draw from the protective impacts, but I would love to see more data. I would love to be on a part of a study that could collect that data and do it for Dane County. I think that'd be really cool because I'm a data wonk, so I love that stuff. But, um, and as far as confounding factors, I mean, no one study can take care of every confounding factor. That's why you have to have a variety of, of studies because if, if one study tried to take on every confounding factor, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a sample size you know that could give you a statistical power so that's why you need a volume of data that looks at the similar or same question and looks at different confounding factors and that's something that we don't have here that would link iq to water fluoridation it's just there's not enough data in the, in the studies that we, that we do have many of them most of them have, have a lot of method problems with with not a, a controlling or acknowledging confounding factors at least some major ones. And I saw the Dr. Pitt um, presentation. I've, I've actually seen a couple of her. She's, she does, she gives a really good presentation, but it doesn't take away my questions and some complaints about the methodology of the study she did in Canada, linking prenatal exposure to IQ. And I know I brought part, part of that up about using the, uh, using the urine because that doesn't necessarily gives you the amount of fluoride that's in the blood that would cross the placenta. No one's saying test the placenta. We're talking about the actual like blood lead, not blood lead, but the blood volume of fluoride. Um, and that along with some social social factors that she may have, that, that she missed and didn't account for that are associated with IQ. I mean, there's just, that's why you need a number of studies looking at this, a breadth of knowledge so we can draw from. And that's, we just, we, we just don't have that. And that's my biggest complaint about the IQ uh, association. It's just, there's not a lot of there there, you know, from the uh, data side that can't be explained away by confounding factors. 
Yeah, I mean, I was kind of trying to turn it down, turn it around to the benefits of carries. And uh, so what is the optimal level? And uh, that's been talked about various times, but I haven't been able to see any of the epi data that suggests there actually is such a level or what, you know, what would be a dose response there? I mean, what you wanna do is have a level of fluoride that is effective for caries and that will then minimize uh, the likelihood of adverse effects rather than, I think you're right. I think it's a big, big lift to try to do studies that'll uh, change the uh, kind of uh, toxicology of fluoride I, as it relates. I, so I, I think I'm, a problem I'm, with that, so does I, Henry, is, is when you're trying to do a dose response about here's your carry and we have to estimate how much water that they drink. We don't even know. It's up to a survey. And then you have to take into a fact their dietary habits. Do they drink, do they eat candy, do they drink sugary drinks? Do they drink more bottled water? I mean, there's a lot of things on, a, on an individual basis that really could, we'd have our own confounding factors of our own study, you know? Yeah, Russ. Yeah, and I just wanted to, Jeff just added what I was thinking of adding as well. And one of the other issues that we've got as far as collecting the data is, yeah, we might be able to get the data from Medicaid, but that requires somebody to collect that data. And currently we are stretched to the max in DHS because of COVID. I know Jeff completely is aware of this, of what's going on. The pandemic's not over and we're still dealing with multiple issues related to, to COVID. I myself am on three different COVID committees and COVID response teams. So we don't have the bandwidth at this point in time to be doing that kind of an analysis. Plus the fact that doesn't address the private sector as well. We'd still have to collect data from the private sector insurance companies as well, which is not always the leap of faith that we can do. The other thing I wanted to mention, Joe, is you were talking about having Kyla Taylor or somebody from NTP. My recommendation also would be that perhaps we have somebody from NASM as well come. Um, for example, David Savitz was chair of the NASM committee that was reviewing this. I think it would be appropriate to have both groups represented to give their viewpoints on this issue as well. Greg. Joe, I'm going to head out here in a couple of minutes to the recruiting event I have to go to, but I'll, I guess what I would like to say is that I think these policies are things that need to be reviewed on a routine basis, say once every three years or five years. And I think the board policy document has something to that effect in it, right? So I think as far as additional studies go, I don't think we're in a position to make a recommendation that we delay our recommendation until those studies come in. I think we've got to come up with a recommendation that's based on the body of evidence that's available now. That body of evidence is more than just the neurotoxic effects. As Henry pointed out, we've got some beneficial dental uh, outcomes that we should be considering as a part of this evaluation. So I think we need to make a recommendation now based on the available evidence and then three years from now or something like that, maybe five years from now, revisit the recommendation based on research that's done over the next three to five years. So I'll leave it at that and let others take the floor. Greg, thank you for sticking around. I know you have that other meeting to go to, but uh, I appreciate you sticking around as long as you did. So, and thank you for those last comments. Janet. Well, I understand that that we um, we can't wait around before giving our recommendation to get results of a study, but as part of our recommendation could be um, that some kinds of studies are done. We can draft that in whatever way. And then the idea was brought up that Department of Health is uh, is overwhelmed with COVID right now. And I'm wondering if there isn't some sort of dental organization that um, that might provide or might be able to accept some sort of grant money to do this kind of study. Um, 
it's it doesn't seem like a difficult thing to to collect basic information and a study that incorporates all of those conditions that Jeff brought up, for example, type of water, you know, we don't know all these details about how people are living or what they're drinking or what they're eating. But those kinds of things can be incorporated into a broad scale, scale study um, to provide some information about, as Henry was saying, the relationship, the dose kind of relationship between um, community fluoridation and caries or other kinds of tooth health um, in a community. It doesn't have to be a limited community, it can be in the entire state. But anyway, so that's, that's, I still have that on my mind. Thank you, Janet. To me, we it sounds like a pretty complicated study though. Um, we we could recommend a study group. I mean, I, the university has all sorts, if, if the health departments don't have staff to participate, uh, it may well be that there's plenty of people at the university uh, with an interest in this and uh, could sit down and you know have a discussion on is it feasible and what kind of a study would you like to see and then could it be done uh, and then get some estimates upon what it would take uh, and it may be not feasible. I mean that maybe a lot of people have already looked at it and decided we're never going to answer that question and therefore it comes down to kind of expert opinion but uh, I think it would be worth, we could recommend that uh, a, a study group be put together to operate for a short spell to kind of brainstorm what could be done. Well, they did do a study like that in Juneau, and then there was another one in Canada somewhere. Um, so this type of study is being done other places. All right. Um, any other final comments on this on this subject before we before we move on? Um, doesn't look like we're going to get a recommendation tonight. Um, it looks like there is um, still some work to do for this committee. Um, it sounds like there is some interest in still hearing from NTP and maybe NASM as well. Um, and we'll try and Henry, would you mind trying to reach out um, and seeing if they might be available for that August meeting? You're on mute. You're on mute, Henry. I mean, uh... Dr. Savitz uh, is a close friend of Jonathan Patz here at the university as well. We can maybe uh, have him invite him to come give a lecture on something else and he might be willing to speak to uh, uh, the issues that uh, they saw, at least as I read their report, seemed to me their concerns were mostly on how best to communicate uh, their message. I, don't, I didn't see a whole lot of challenge to their scientific discussion, but more more clearly explaining how they got from point A to point B. But I, I we could try to get someone to come and, and speak to that. It's a matter of do we have questions for them? Would that be beneficial? Uh, or is it just to provide more access to different voices for the broader community? Mm -hmm. Jeff. Yeah, so I almost forgot my question, but um, if there is a, you know, a study team that's formed, I would love to be on it because I just, I love this kind of stuff. But um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. question is more for Ross. Uh, I don't know if we even have the infrastructure to collect the carries data. We, we have something we have to build from scratch. And when it comes to like a private insurance companies, is that data proprietary? Because I remember when I was on a group about a decade ago, it took us two years to get asthma data from the hospitals. It seemed like it would be so easy, but it took us two or three years just trying to negotiate how it's represented, who gets what, who shares what. It was just, it was a freaking nightmare. We got it, but it took a hell of a hell of a long time. Yeah, 
Yeah, and Jeff is right, Joe. Um, for example, that's why the study that was done in Juneau, Alaska, they only used Medicaid data because of the obstacles that they were encountering or were going to encounter regarding the private sector. Plus the fact these things have a tendency to be a lot more expensive, a substantial sum of money to do this type of study. And I'm not opposed to it, but again, we're dealing with issues with the government that's spending money and or fist to protect people with COVID, I don't see them being reticent to give funding for something like this. I'm not opposed to it, but I don't see it happening. And that's just the reality of the situation. Jeff, I don't know if you've got a comment on that as well. Well, no, just speaking for me personally, I mean, I'm up to my neck deep in COVID work. So I'm just trying to catch up on reports that were due last year. You know, because I've been doing contact tracing and now we're doing testing and strategy data. So we're still, I'm still doing COVID, but trying to trying to squeeze in like mosquito reports and childhood lead reports. And yeah, so I'm neck deep too, but I still think it would be a cool idea for a study, but I'm not sure who's going to pay for it. But so the more data, the better, I think. Well, there's all sorts of different methods. I mean, uh, as far as getting access to people, I mean, we have uh, in the past, at least I was involved in doing uh, uh, dialing up to uh, uh, women with uh, their uh, infants and looking at mercury levels. And, and the show project is out there for adults. So I think we have uh, methods to uh, gather information from the specific individuals could look at, but Mostly, I would say before doing that, I would want to have a study that everybody agrees this will be helpful, rather than trying to have somebody do something and then uh, we just get uh, criticism of it uh, uh, when we're done. So I think to have some kind of a group that would come up with this is the best that can be done and have people say, yeah, we think this would be valuable, then we can go out and pursue getting funding for it. All right, so I think we've um, probably exhausted this conversation. There's some challenges ahead, um, but but clearly there is an interest in um, putting together a study group, whether it's local, uh, regional, or statewide, um, that could provide some additional information in terms of the beneficial effects. So what are some of those uh, positive effects, um, or or maybe not maybe not drawing that conclusion, but looking at the the levels and seeing um, uh, looking for an association between fluoride level and and caries rate. I think that's what what we were kind of um, coming to um, with that with that discussion there. Um, and so. Um, so what I think we'll do is I think we'll wrap up the, um, the discussion on, on, on fluoride for right now. Um, we'll try and see if we can have some, some uh, representation from the National Toxicology Program um, at, our, at our August meeting um, and, uh, and see if we can get some recommendation after that. So um, I'm, not, I'm not hearing overwhelming um, objection to the status quo, right? So the continuation of our current fluoridation policy, um, I, I, I am hearing that there are some concerns about uh, neurotoxicity during that window of prenatal and immediately postnatal. I mean, that, that I think is, is at least um, an emerging concern, um, but, um, and, and a consequence of that may be some outreach, uh, maybe from public health departments in terms of advice to pregnant women um, and mothers of, of, of young infants um, in terms of 
their fluoride exposures and uh, and uh, what they might do in terms of um, either breastfeeding or bottle feeding um, their infants. Jeff, did I did I say something incorrect there? You're on mute. I'm on mute. Sorry. I, I was just curious what kind of advice you'd want us to give because we already give breastfeeding advice and formula advice, and there's not enough data to warn it off like water fluoridation. So I, I don't I'm not sure what advice public health department would give in this particular, you know, item for water fluoridation in the pregnancy. But they'd be pretty speculative, I think. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, we're in the business of delivering water, right? Uh, public health is in the business of making recommendations on, on things related to health. So, um, so uh, I, with that, I think we'll wrap this up and we'll move on to our, our next agenda item, which is item number two, our PFAS update and discussion. Uh, we'll probably wrap this up uh, by 6.30. Uh, that would be the intent here. So um, I have a short presentation that uh, I was planning to make, and then we can have some discussion about that. Uh, so- Joe, can I stick around for the PFAS? Is that okay? Because I haven't been, been exposed to it in a while. Anybody who wants to stick around uh, yeah. is welcome to stick around. So if folks came, join the call for fluoride, we're done with fluoride. Uh, if you'd like to stick around for the PFAS discussion, by all means, please do.